Good morning. I'm Kirsten Singleton, Executive Director of Education and Professional Development. And on behalf of the Massachusetts Health and Hospital Association, welcome to today's virtual conference, Come Back with Confidence with Paul Keckley. A few logistics before we start. We will be recording this session for those who aren't able to join us and all lines will be in listen only mode. If you have questions during the webinar, please enter them into the chat feature. The questions will come directly to us and we'll do our best to address as many of them as we can during our time today. Following the webinar, we'll be sending out a brief survey. I'd like to take a moment to thank MHA's 2020 sponsors for their support in underwriting today's virtual conference, which is just one of many events that we're bringing to our members to help address timely issues relating to COVID-19 pandemic and other need to know issues. In particular, I'd like to thank Lumeris, our featured sponsor today and partner on our event. During today's session, we will discuss how to come back with confidence as we emerge from the COVID-19 pandemic and begin planning for long-term financial sustainability. This discussion promises to ignite a conversation around innovation in a time when health systems are facing increasingly narrow margins and a need to effectively manage the health of their populations. Now, I'm pleased to introduce our speakers for the day. Paul Keckley is managing editor of the Keckley Report, a healthcare policy analyst and widely known industry expert. He's a frequent speaker and advisor to healthcare organizations focused on long-term growth, sustainability and advocacy strategies. In addition to the weekly Keckley Report, he's published three books and 250 articles. During the period preceding the passage of the Affordable Care Act, he facilitated sessions between the White House Office of Health Reform and major health industry trade groups as a private sector input was sought in the legislation. He's an advisor to Erdman, Sullivan Cotter, Lumeris, Western Governors University, and the Lipscomb University College, College of Pharmacy. He's a member of the Health Executive Network and Healthcare Financial Management Association. Our moderator today is Matt Nolan, and he has nearly 15 years of experience as a strategic advisor to healthcare organizations, working closely with executives from provider groups, health systems, and health plans. As a vice president for strategic partnerships at Lumeris, Matt works with organizations to form collaborative partnerships focused on optimizing performance under value-based arrangements. Before joining Lumeris, Matt worked at ECG Management Consultants, where he specialized in designing value-focused provider compensation structures, as well as developing integrated physician group practices. So we're delighted to have you both here today. You can turn your video and audio on, Paul and Matt. And without further ado, I will hand it over to your lively discussion. Terrific, thanks so much. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm glad you're able to attend. I know Paul and I are excited this morning, um, bright and early. Um, one of the things that we were talking about in advance is that we want this to be an interactive discussion by all means. So please uh, feel free to send any questions you may have in the chat. And what we'll do is we'll pick those up as we'll go along. Obviously, we'll have time towards the end of our meeting today to, to jump and address those. But ideally, we'd like to have you all engaged and we could be answering your questions as we go. So please feel free to do that and we'll be certain to get to that. And if we don't get to it during the course of the discussion, we'll, we'll try to carve out some time at the end of it. So, um, Paul, I thought we'd just jump right in and, and kick things off. And I think one of the first things, I'm sure it's on the forefront of a lot of folks' mind, is, is to kind of get your thoughts on uh, how you anticipate the election playing out and, and what is that election going to mean for healthcare? One, and we'll talk through that. And then maybe at the same time, are there just certain healthcare trends that um, are innovations that really are going to come to bear kind of regardless of the election outcome? Is there momentum behind certain things that regardless of who wins and, the, and how we see the dynamics play out next Tuesday that that you think are going to continue forward. So I'll start there and, and feel free to address that as you see fit. Yeah, that could take the rest of the day. Right. right. <laughs> uh, start with the election, Matt. Um, any forecast is pointing toward uh, potentially a blue wave, uh, which would mean the Senate flips, a net gain of at least four Senate seats by Democrats, uh, continued uh, majority of Democrats in the House. And 538 has uh, Biden winning at a certainty of 87%. Now, you know, there's seven days till the election, but if you begin assuming it's a blue wave, I wouldn't 
count on that necessarily, but if we assume that, then uh, the healthcare uh, tailwinds point to several things that are pretty clear. One is uh, that you would see expanded coverage through a variety of mechanisms, uh, expanding eligibility for Medicaid programs, expanding subsidies for individuals who purchase uh, private coverage through the health exchanges. And then a Biden administration has promised a public option, uh, which would be a Medicare-like product available to folks under 65. Now, a lot of things can happen. So those are kind of all the promises. What's the theme that kind of drives a lot of this? There are two that I'm very keen to follow. One is how do we address this burgeoning federal deficit? Um, we're sitting on $27 trillion of federal debt, um, which puts us into a very precarious position of having to spend uh, almost 9% of the revenue of the federal government on interest cost. So just think about it in the average household, if more and more of your discretionary spending is obligated to pay interest costs, then do you buy uh, a car or just get the one you have fixed or do you uh, delay certain purchases? So it puts healthcare in a precarious position because um, we're dependent on federal funds and state funds and local funds. So if the coffers of the uh, federal, state and local governments are shrinking due to less discretionary spending by consumers and Matt, not to get geeky here, but 70% um, of the economy of this country is based on what people buy on consumer purchases. So if you deflate at all the spending uh, habits of households then you cut into the revenues at every level of government. Mm -hmm. So if the government has a huge amount of debt and you've got this, you know, this decline of spending by consumers, something's got to give. And that's one theme to follow. But the second that's pretty obvious is uh, there's recognition, whether it's a Biden administration or it's a Trump administration, that uh, the status quo in the healthcare system uh, is complicit in unnecessary spending, higher costs than should be uh, experienced. Uh, the CBO's forecast is that spending would increase 5.4% per year through 2028. Well, that sounds, you know, pretty normal for healthcare, except that it, it really hurts every other part of the economy. If the rest of the economy is having to operate at three, three percent per or, or so inflation rate, or even less, and healthcare says, "Well, I need five and a half percent to keep everybody happy," something's got to give. So, what has to give there yep. is a change of the incentive in the system for providers from this quote volume to value transition. But here's the Here's the tailwind. Here's what to count on. How does either administration accelerate that? What do they do to essentially say, in order to make better use of healthcare funds, we have to change those incentives for providers faster than we've been doing since the Affordable Care Act 10 years ago? Because a lot of these 50 plus alternative payment models have had kind of modest success. Right. Some of the ACOs did okay, but three out of four didn't. Uh, some of the bundles like uh, joint replacement saved some money, but most haven't. So what do you do to re-engineer these uh, alternative payment programs to accelerate this transition from volume to value? And I honestly think regardless of whether it's uh, a Trump administration holdover or it's the Biden administration, both are gonna be a part of their agenda. 
So I think one of the biggest things, Paul, uh, on that note is that you hear from a lot of providers that the move to value one, I think there's difficulty in defining well, what does that even mean? First, yeah. of all, I think yeah. they have their perspective, providers have their perspective. And to your point, it, it's been moderate success. I think some would even contend it, it's been, you know, largely unsuccessful, right? So I guess, what are you seeing on the horizon in terms of how we're going to actually make this move the value successful? How is, what's the government planning from that perspective? Well, there's, uh, it, again, it's gonna depend on who's sitting in those uh, key roles in the 27 agencies that report up under HHS and others. Uh, but I think there are some common currents. Uh, one would be that, um, Price transparency, if you're in the Biden world and you're stepping in, um, may make a lot of uh, political sense. It may be a popular concept, like each of the folks in this call has to report uh, January 1, 21. But the fact is total cost of care is the focus. What are all the costs that have to be understood and then how do you base comparisons on total cost of care uh, rather necessarily than the unit price for each widget in the system? So that's that's going to be uh, a clear distinction between the administrations a little bit. Uh, a second is um, Medicare Advantage is kind of an interesting um, platform for a lot of these innovations. So not surprisingly in the Trump administration, you saw an expansion of coverage for Medicare Advantage. You saw exponential growth in membership. It's uh, 27 million and change. And you saw um, these additional services added uh, like supplemental benefits, uh, over-the-counter uh, treatments, travel, et cetera. Would you expect that to change in a Biden administration? Probably not. Probably what you see is an expansion of Medicare Advantage. Sure. Um, and you would see not just an expansion of Medicare Advantage, but you'd see that mirrored in managed Medicaid. Mm -hmm. uh, remember the federal government uh, between Medicaid and Medicare has 115 million people that it covers. So why would you think that model works for Medicare where you're managing the health and holding providers accountable for more innovative ways of caring for populations and not carry that over to Medicaid. So I think you'll see a big uh, convergence of Medicaid and Medicare managed care. And the key model underneath both of those will be an MA type model. And before we lose uh, this, the, the Biden administration, uh, plan is to expand Medicare uh, to those uh, down to 60 years of age. So that to me is a pretty compelling view of how each administration, but potentially, especially a Biden administration, uh, is going to be managing cost through a managed care model. Now, how much of that uh, replaces the efforts in the alternative payment programs? Too soon to tell. Uh, we don't know for sure how the commercial population is impacted by this, but we certainly know that the government under either administration is going to pursue this. So it's, it's an interesting dynamic. So just to kind of repeat what you're saying and then ask a question off of that, you're having, you're going to see an expansion in Medicare, most likely. That's a trend. And you're going to see the expansion in Medicaid. And it's going to be managed, both Medicare and Medicaid. Um, ultimately, a decreasing portion of the pie is going to be attributed to commercial, most likely. And so when you think about the economics of that, right, and if we're going to be moving to total cost of care, right, there's going to be a lot of compression and pressure on margins that are already tight for a lot of provider organizations across the country. Um, I guess, what are you seeing? How are, how are organizations beginning to prepare and change the way they deliver care in response to this? Well, there are a couple of things. Uh, Massachusetts has, uh, I follow Massachusetts. I went to Washington in 2006 at the same point that uh, Massachusetts uh, passed uh, Article 58, the health reform in Massachusetts. And then uh, what followed was their health policy commission in 2012. 
Um, so they set benchmarks on what total spending should be in the state, and these were targets. And I think the current target's 3.1% or so. Um, what the federal government doesn't have is targeting. Federal government doesn't have the right strategies and tactics in place to accelerate this transition from volume to value. So what I suspect you'll see is some uh, kind of system-wide approach to benchmarking. What should we be spending in healthcare? Should it be 1% above the GDP? Which if you recall was what the uh, Independent Payment Advisory Board in the Affordable Care Act proposed. Uh, that was one of the early things that Congress uh, kicked out. But I think a Biden administration kicks that back in. What's the benchmark that we need to target? Uh, second, um, each of these models transitioning volume to values depended on very effective uh, primary care, but they are not the primary care of the past. It's primary care that includes dental, ophthalmic, uh, pharmacy benefit, nutrition. Uh, it's a holistic view of primary care and it's the convergence of preventive health programs, some of which we you know, describe as social determinant related and traditional primary care. Um, so you combine those two, we have to set some level of benchmarking. What's the amount of money that the system of the future can afford and then we integrate primary preventive social determinants of care into a model which you know obviously matt's where a lot of private equity is making its bets right now sure then you've got the front door to a system and you've got a mechanism for determining how much we can afford to spend now how you legislate that is the sausage making, uh, how will you incrementally move in that direction? Uh, because the status quo will fight against those tooth and nail. Um, yeah. They don't want benchmarks because we've all gotten uh, pretty financially successful because we didn't have any limits on what we could spend. And we've always regarded our system as quote best because of its specialty care. We are uh, comparatively not as strong in primary and preventive health as other developed systems. And we're pretty strong relative to specialty care. Uh, when I've done research uh, across the country, when you ask the specialists what that really means, they say, well, we're certainly in agreement that primary care needs more money but any limits on access to us, any direct limits on getting to us would be opposed. And by the way, don't cut our pay to increase primary care pay. So that's a that's tension that we're gonna see uh, kind of come to the surface over the next couple of years. Well, as part of that tension that you're describing there between primary care and specialists, the reason why we see the, the increasing presence of your Chen Meds, your Oak Streets, your yeah. Agora Health, your Village MDs, and, and the model where they're disintermediating really the, the legacy hospital structure, um, and then going and managing really the patient population outside of that. Spot on. Um, I've been tracking the uh, where private equity is making its bets. And when you begin to see the Oaks and Ioras and Chens and Privias and these other models that are attracting very strong private equity backing in tandem with uh, where uh, some of the insurers are making their big bets, whether it's Humana with their uh, clinics uh, in partnerships with uh, a Walmart or whether it's United acquiring uh, Poly Clinic and they now employ 46,000 docs. Everyone recognizes that the center of the system of the future is an organized collection of high performing uh, professionals, health professionals, not just doctors. Mm -hmm. And that's key. It's, it's mental health providers, it's nutritionists, it's health coaches. Uh, the biggest uh, gap in medical training is in uh, 
managing patient behavior, uh, kind of cognitive therapies and ways of behavior modification that work for certain individuals with certain predispositions and values and beliefs. We don't really teach that well. So it's not just a group of doctors. Mm -hmm. It's a collection of uh, health professionals that see true north. They've got a common objective. Uh, they have data on which to manage their decision making. They share risk. The financial risk is shared. And they are motivated to manage populations at full risk. Right. Now, you get from here to there, and in each market, there are going to be different dynamics to get there. But that's that's where we're headed. So, so how do health health systems, which really serve the broader community, right? They don't, for lack of a better term, they're not cherry picking patients, right? They're serving all takers, right? Um, I guess how do they how do they protect themselves against the encroachment of these new I'll call them aggregators in the marketplace, right? Because if if the idea is that we're going to increasingly move patients to the front line, managed by primary care physicians, but also holistically. How do they better position themselves to respond to uh, that encroachment by these new organizations? Well, the obvious starting point is you, you cannot uh, command uh, a high price based on a higher cost structure that is necessary. And the data shows that somewhere between 15 and 25% of the total cost of care uh, might be inefficient or waste. There may be areas where you can cut. So reference pricing is going to be the ways that these integrated provider organizations select specialty providers. Um, and these reference prices are not just local. So, uh, you know, what happens in Boston is going to be uh, not just compared to Western Mass, but it's compared to Atlanta uh, and increasingly unbundled. So first point, and, and this is one of the interesting things about Massachusetts, they've had a great track record of being innovators uh, mm -hmm. in health policy. Uh, they've always had a tendency toward high levels of health disparity and high levels of utilization of outpatient care. So it's an interesting uh, <laughs> contradiction there. Uh, the second thing they'll be doing is having to provide the specialist in their cadre of uh, providers data so that as networks narrow, uh, it's not the hospital that takes the bullets for that. It's the uh, validity and reliability of the data on which this strong primary care base chooses its specialist. Mm -hmm. And to be careful here, uh, one of the things the Health Policy Commission and CHIA has done in Massachusetts is do a pretty good job of aggregating data, but that data is not readily accessible to the individual orthopedist or endocrinologist or individual specialist level. That data upon which uh, a group of providers selects and narrows its networks yep. is key. Yep. And unless hospitals can provide a vehicle for getting that data, in a uh, neutral position. We're providing you the data. This is not the hospital picking the specialist. Yep. This is the data that's out there. Um, that's the second and I think equally important part of the puzzle. You've got to have a low cost position to play in that world and you better have data. And if you don't have both of those, then you spend a lot of money advertising that you're one of America's uh, 800 top 100 hospitals in the country, right? <laughs> yeah, that's you, right. That's you try exactly. Try to convince right. people, and and honestly, uh, Massachusetts hospitals are like many others. They're guilty of that. They believe their own publicity, but that's not the future. Uh, data will drive a lot of these decisions, and employers are going to be uh, just huge consumers of this data as they narrow their networks and choose their physician organizations. So it's ultimately building an attractive, comprehensive network that's able to manage cost effectively, right? Um, being able to respond to what the commercial population, the employer population needs, but also 
the payer population, but then also the data, because what you're saying is that once that data is in the hands of those primary care providers, frontline providers, they're going to self-select really who those specialists are, especially under total cost of care contracts. They're going to self-select naturally the specialists that they want to push their patients towards. Absolutely. And it's the natural, uh, it's, it's kind of Darwinian in some sense. It's the data will continue to narrow the provider networks uh, by self-selection. If I can uh, negotiate with, and, and here's another interesting part of this, Matt, I've studied in various specialties how that process naturally occurs. Um, so if you're in orthopedics, it's very easy to see that spine surgery will be isolated. Uh, so a lot of orthopedists think I, I'd like to do spines and hips and hands and knees and scoliosis and a little of everything. Uh, what this natural Darwinian view of selection happens is you begin to narrow these very narrow. Yeah. So I'm going to have the folks that do the spines or I'm going to have the folks that do the very complicated quadruple bypass with uh, pig valves on people that have a BMI of north of 35. So that's the process over time for selecting and narrowing networks. So, uh, you know, it makes, uh, I don't know if you saw this recently, but Blue Cross Blue Shield of Illinois did a partnership with Epic where they are setting up a new technology interface where the exchange of information between select systems and organizations in the community. And I think it's supposed to go live beginning in November. But anyhow, I think it gets to your point that naturally that information is going to be readily in front of the physicians, right? And they'll be able to make almost real time um, changes in terms of how they practice. Well, isn't it interesting because uh, obviously Massachusetts has four big plans and um, they've all been active in interacting with doctors around data, the medical homes and everything kind of originated up there. Um, what would happen if it was the hospital providing that data instead of the health plans? Mm -hmm. uh, do the doctors receive that data differently? Do they have a chance to scrub the data? The rub dating back now 20 years to Texas with Aetna has been that, that when the plans come up with data on report cards, it's based on claims data and it's inaccurate. So the validity and reliability of the data that's provided needs to be uh, first and foremost um, antiseptic. It has to be completely free of any perceived biases, methodological uh, error and so on. And the source matters. Um, I was studying this morning some data on uh, sources of information, how people are going to digest information about the vaccines uh, for COVID. And the, the, there was a writer named Marshall McLuhan years ago who used to say the medium is the message. The source of the information is more important than the information itself. We're starting to see that in the COVID stuff that yeah. where information originates determines how people, how much they believe it. So data for doctors has to be believable and it has to be from a source they trust, which is the reason medical leadership is so key. Um, we have to have physician leaders who are understanding the data, its source, its methodology, and advocates for valid and reliable data on which these decisions are made. Uh, can't be done by the suits, right? You've got to have MD or DO after your name to own Absolutely. this. So Paul, you mentioned one thing in there. So the narrowing of networks, historically um, employers have been resistant to wanting to narrow the networks to give their employees as much uh, choice as possible, right? Uh, you have health systems saying, well, it's difficult for me to go at, at a guaranteed cost trend type of pro uh, product with you if, if, if you're ultimately having a broad network, right? I, I need to be able to do the care management. I need to go narrow with my network so we can control this. Is, is part of the, the outcomes of COVID is, is our employers kind of re, totally rethinking may, how do they uh, manage their employee population and the, and the amount of cost that's available? And yes. opening, opening the narrow networks? Absolutely. This is, uh, so while Medicare and Medicaid seem to be migrating toward kind of a, a Medicare Advantage 
uh, 2.0 and 3.0. Uh, employers are stepping back, and this is not all employers. As you know, when you get north of really 500 employees in a company, you're self-insured in all likelihood, uh, and you're part of a coalition and you're sharing data within your industry. Smaller and mid-sized companies don't tend to do that too much. So the larger the company and the more significant it is in an industry, the more likely they are now to be thinking, we've got to get on board with a new view of uh, what employer-sponsored health benefits need to look like. Mm -hmm. So the things that are fascinating here is many of them saying, why don't I just have this primary care uh, as a cost center in my organization? So I'll employ directly, uh, and there's some laws in states that you know make that a caveat, but why don't I employ primary care in my organization? And I'll uh, set it up where the employees are able to use it for non-emergent uh, problems like they would a retail clinic at a drugstore, but they keep a medical record there. And then over time, uh, very quickly, you have two to 5,000 charts uh, per primary care provider, and now they're acting as the gatekeeper for the company's healthcare. Uh, so on-site or near-site primary care is a rethinking. Mm -hmm. who, would have, who would have thought that we wouldn't just allow the employees to go to any primary care doctor they chose? And you see these interesting uh, companies around the country that are uh, becoming very bold in how they're empowering that using uh, on-site pharmacy and over-the-counter therapies and a lot of alternative therapies in lieu of traditional, you got to go to the orthopedist to get your low back pain checked out. Yep. Um, a second is um, the use of hard data around these reference prices. It is employers who are comparing data on their total cost of care for a spine or uh, cabbage procedure, and they're, and they're sharing it among themselves so they can make these decisions. They're not dependent on the health insurer for that data. And that's key. If, if you see this um, gap widening between what insurance companies do and what employers do and the data they use and the resources they use, uh, you could expect some employer activism. You could expect employers to go much further in managing health benefits. Let me give you an example. Uh, most employers have been building their benefits on an annual basis. So you annually subscribe and resubscribe and you've got four benefit options. What if an employer said, uh, it's important in my uh, book of business for my employees and dependents to have a three-year contract with a provider organization at four right. years so that I can really front end load all those preventive health diagnostic and screening mechanisms. And I get the benefit of reduced utilization of the hospital and some of these unnecessary services. You cannot do that and get a positive ROI if it's an annual contract. Absolutely. And if that savings accrues to the benefit of the insurer, not to the employee's benefit or healthiness, then what have you saved? Uh, it's no surprise that the tension between large insurers and large employers is growing. Yep. Uh, maybe the exception is Cigna, which has kind of historically been an ASO uh, company. They did a lot of administrative services for large self-insured and really weren't as much in the risk business. But um, I think a theme of the future uh, in tandem with Medicare and Medicaid taking on more the model of Medicare Advantage per se will be the independence of large self-insured employers that create alternative strategies. And it's alternative delivery strategies, it's alternative pricing strategies, and it's a much more holistic approach to health. It's not simply having, quote, an EAP program and having a wellness benefit. Those have not proven to do as well as managing whole person care. So I think that's what they're going to do. Interestingly, on that front, two of the biggest employers in the country, I don't know if you saw recently, but Amazon started posting job descriptions for 
I think a VP level or higher individuals to come in who have experience in terms of acquiring provider networks, right? That so, and they put it out there, you know, there was, it was written up, I think, Modern Healthcare, I believe, but obviously, you know, to be very blunt about it, they're saying we're looking, right? And if they start acquiring practices, that will be interesting. At the same time, from an employer perspective, you have Walmart who's going to be launching a health plan. I believe it's in Georgia. Um, I guess that's, I don't know if that's 2021 or 2022, but I think it just reinforces your point that employers are, are getting into this in a more very material fashion. Yeah, and you've got CBS Adma that uh, Larry Merlo is telling the street, uh, we think these employer markets are opportunities for us. Uh, we don't think these people necessarily think they've got to go through the front door of a local health system. They can go through CVS slash Aetna slash our minute clinics and the variety of assets we put together. Uh, and in markets like Houston and others, uh, they've put three to 5,000 square foot health hubs inside their stores. So they become primary care clinics. Right. So uh, I think the landscape changes. That's the bottom line. And employers, I think, will take a somewhat alternative route than Medicare and Medicaid. I'm not sure yeah. in some markets you assume that the two are in parallel swim lanes. So, Paul, I, I got a question from the chat here for you. Um, are you aware of any patient behavioral management strategies that appear to be effective in behavior modification? Right. Oh, oh. Such a great question. I've studied uh, when I was at Vanderbilt, my focus of research was, uh, quote, patient engagement, patient experience, how you change consumer behavior. And what I found in in most cases is that uh, sticks worked better than carrots. So the research showed that unless an individual uh, interpreted a medical diagnosis in a teachable moment, and this is key, coming back to what's the teachable moment for an individual when you can change their behavior, unless they saw significant uh, consequence, meaning fear, or a financial uh, impact that they were prone not to change their behavior. Mm -hmm. And so you had the question of, well, what's the best stick? And that's where it gets pretty interesting. Sticks vary. So if you're in the uh, lower two quintile in our socioeconomics of this country, uh, out of pocket costs for prescription drugs of, of less than $10 can be a significant stick. But when you get to the bottom quintile, the lower 20%, um, there's simply no intent to fill the prescription anyway. I don't have that out of pocket. So financials in terms of co-pays are a significant stick for certain strata in the population. Uh, a second stick is um, this notion of job security. Uh, it turns out that for the 162 million people that work, um, that a sense of knowing I've got a job and a paycheck is key. Now, obviously we've lost 22 million of those in the current pandemic, but does the potential that you would lose your job become a consequence, a stick, Mm -hmm. that can be used. So here's where this gets tricky, Matt. Who's going to communicate that? Right. The communicator should be the clinician or the care team. That's the reason this notion of extended primary care requires health coaching. It requires specialist in behavior modification. It's not the doctor in a three to seven minute drive-by saying, when you go home, do yeah. this, this, and this and see me again in 60 days. So we do a lousy job of that. Right. So one of the reasons this primary care first model is pretty interesting uh, that CMS has proposed and it's, uh, I guess, 26 markets will have this product, uh, this model next year, uh, is it says, we're gonna give you a little extra money to health coach these people. Well, that's a no brainer, right? But we've got to create a system that reinforces that and it's not the 30 second drive by by the clinician. It's how we use digital tools beginning in the teachable moment 
to articulate the sticks and make some carrots available mm -hmm. and reinforce that through routine interaction with individuals. And here's the, the second point and their uh, influencers. Everyone, everyone's behavior is influenced by at least one to two other people, their health behaviors. Sure. So it turns out uh, <laughs> that men are boneheads for many of the conditions that require treatment. But if their significant other or spouse or son or daughter or financial advisor can be alerted and you can do that through a digital connectivity team, then you can begin to modify behavior. So that's a very, very long answer. This is, a, this is probably the least uh, studied and most important transition from volume to value. Sure. Because at some point, the rewards we get from managing care more effectively are dependent on what the patients do themselves, right? Yeah. But we, we, we can't assume that they shouldn't share in some of these uh, financial benefits. If, and, and the system has essentially said, yeah, we think your behavior is important. So medication adherence, which is, as you know, about for less than 30% or fewer people take the meds as directed. If you're past a five-day prescription, the chance is they're going to fall off the cliff. Uh, why shouldn't a person that takes the med as directed for 30 days be rewarded uh, beyond saying, at a boy? Right. Why shouldn't they share in some of the shared savings? And why That's shouldn't right. those, that data about how much they help save be accessible to them, not just their provider? Now you're talking about volume to value. Absolutely. And, and, and you can understand just from that perspective, the provider's frustration to some degree saying, okay, I'm at risk for managing this individuals, but I tell them to not to go smoke. And I tell them to not eat five cheeseburgers a day. And, you know, how can I ultimately really drive an impact? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you bring up, here's, here's where that fits in, in the affordable care act. We had this vigorous debate about uh, quality and how you measure it. And um I guess reluctantly, there was recognition that you have to depend on process measures, not outcome measures. So I advise somebody not to smoke, check the box. I did what I was supposed to do, which is the process, uh, but they didn't quit smoking. So how do we, in this transition from volume to value, also transition the uh, metrics for defining quality from process measures to outcomes? Mm -hmm. Well, you've got to have a defined set of outcomes to start. So one of the things uh, that the administration has done, to their credit, is the uh, simplification of these measures so that we have a group of standardized measures that can be collected and used across time. Uh, and second, they have um, put a lot more emphasis on, quote, the patient experience. If you notice in most of these models, the patient experience begins as a modest part of the set of measures, anywhere from 15 to 20 percent. Then over time, it becomes bigger. So this is a credit. I'm, I'm an equal opportunity. I'm not partisan. <laughs> um, this is something that the Trump people, I think this and price transparency, I think they kind of moved us in the positive direction that we should be going. Probably don't go far enough and probably don't have the right vision of true north. But um, we're going to get there. Yep. This, is a, this is an important area. So I got another question from the chat for you, Paul. Um, will, will telemedicine favor hospitals, health systems, or the disruptors such as CVS, et cetera? And do you have any other thoughts on, on ripple effects beyond that of telemedicine? Well, that's a great question. Um, so here's what we know about the telehealth stuff now. And for folks in Massachusetts, we really got our we cut our teeth on telehealth in Connecticut years ago, 20 plus years ago. So you know, back with the old Connecticut stuff, uh, telehealth will uh, not replace as many visits as people anticipate. And there's one basic reason for that. Um, the payments by insurers for a televisit are not likely to be the equivalent of an in-person visit there'll be substantially less. Uh, the reason this has been a, 
uh, an uptick of the past uh, eight months has been the COVID uh, put fear in the hearts of people about going to offices and the Relief Act said we'll pay the same rate. The Relief Act made you hold if you did a televisit. So if the insurance payments going forward are less than a physical visit, why will the physicians who are not at full risk for cost, key caveat here, not those that are at full risk for cost, why would they not prefer an in-person visit where they can get 20% more per visit? Sure. Uh, so I'm, a, the, I'm, I'm sensing in the data that we're gonna see about a 15 uh, to 20% televisit impact, meaning that 15 to 20% of the in-person visits in certain specialties, intermediate visits in uh, mental health, primary care, certain uh, low-risk post-operative uh, where we're querying the patient about their adherence, but we don't need a physical exam. So 15 to 20% of visits impacted by digital substitute and that the insurance companies will pay somewhere in the range of uh, Eighty-five percent of the physical visit for that televisit. If you combine those sweet spots, yeah, it's going to have some impact, but it's not the dramatic uh, disruption that we saw in the first in in April, May, and July. Uh, it's just not going to be that number. Gotcha. Because the relief funds are not going to be there to keep making people whole. Right. right? The sustained, yeah, that kind of level of reimbursement. Right. Got it. Um, I got I got another question for you, Paul, real quick, and then um, and then we're going to start to kind of wrap some things up here. Um, so I, I just saw in the news, I think I guess it was late last night or maybe during the day, that Intermountain and Sanford have signed yeah. a letter of intent. Right, this is going to be Sanford second go at a large kind of merger acquisition. The the one with Advocate fell through at the last second. Advocates since and gone and tried to align first with Suma, dropped that. Now with Beaumont, but that's run into a roadblock. <laughs> um, is, is COVID having any kind of impact on these large health system mergers, mergers and acquisitions? Is that just a trend that's beyond that kind of market force or, or what are you seeing there? Well, I think there are two things that have kind of uh, accelerated some of these uh, uh, overnight courtships and marriages. One is recognition. If you're thinking it's a blue wave election, and you just happen to read the uh, Biden uh, health platform, uh, it explicitly says we're going after consolidation that's added cost. Mm -hmm. we're, gonna, we're gonna limit that consolidation. So if you'd run the natural course on this, how fast will the FTC and the DOJ become activists in uh, reducing the likelihood of a consolidation? Let's just go ahead and do it now. Let's see if we can get it done. And there's been a lot of very unfavorable publicity about consolidation. Uh, the certificate of public advantage, remember COPAs, yeah. which allowed a lot of consolidation of, uh, we've got a couple of those in Texas and others. Now the press is kind of picking up on this and saying, I thought this consolidation was just the way things had to be. Uh, now the press is saying, well, no, all the promises made to the state attorney general about reducing costs by consolidating services and doing this never happened. So I've never seen in my career kind of this confluence of media is paying more attention to this. And this, this announcement with Intermountain Sanford is not a done deal. That's going right. to take a lot of scrutiny. And we have uh, the potential of an administration coming in and saying, we think this is complicit in unnecessary cost. So they have purposely built into their uh, platform in, in uh, he called it the other night in the debate, Biden care. Uh, he said, we're going after this. We think consolidation has hurt consumers and added cost and we're going after it. Got it. I think that's the last, I know Kristen, you wanted to come on and uh, I think we got a, just a little bit of time left here, Paul. And I think Kristen wanted to come on and ask one final question before we sure. kind of things up. 
Yes, first of all, thank you, Matt and Paul, for a really great, lively discussion, especially at this hour of the morning. Um, I took a ton of notes, and um, it gives me a lot of great ideas for future education for our members. Um, but I do have a question under the breaking news um, heading. Uh, last night, we swore in um, the new Justice of the Supreme Court. So, Paul, you are on the spot here. What do you, what do you think will be the impact on health care with Amy Coney Barrett on the bench? Well, there are at least five big cases, not just California v. Texas that they'll hear November 10th, but Roe v. Wade and some others. Uh, I think uh, a 6-3 conservative uh, court will rule, for instance, on the ACA, that it is that the individual mandate is severable from the rest of the Affordable Care Act and therefore leave it in place. Um, and my reasoning there is, is one, the disruption impacted by uh, eliminating the ACA and throwing it back to the Fifth Circuit, which essentially said the whole law should be thrown out, start over. Remember, if it's a blue wave, what the Biden administration has said is we have to fix and repair the Affordable Care Act. Don't throw it out. Uh, second, if you have... Um, a number of people that uh, were covered, you've got 11 million through these uh, health exchanges like the Connector in Massachusetts and others. Um, what do you do about health insurance for these folks that were newly insured? And then ironically in the Biden platform, uh, they say we're gonna make uh, these services available also to 4.9 million uh, immigrants that are in the country. So I think the disruption in society from throwing out the ACA is a much greater peril than simply saying the individual mandate uh, is not constitutional. Uh, I remember in the 2006 Massachusetts plan, you had a, uh, an employer mandate for employers above 10, remember that? Uh, and uh, an individual mandate, you knocked your own insurance down to 3%. Um, I think it's reality that the Supreme Court is going to find moderate positions on some issues like they did in 2012. The John Roberts Court said the Affordable Care Act is not unconstitutional, but you can't require that every state expand its Medicaid program. If you remember that uh, June 2012 set of decisions, so I think they're more inclined to that more moderate position than what a 6-3 conservative uh, vote on the face looks like. If I were uh, betting on how the Supreme Court's going to argue and rule, and by the way, Gerson, the, the rulings, there are 29 uh, cases on the current docket. So they're, they've done 10 so far. They've got 19 before this term ends. And they have to report out all of their rulings sometime next year. They have to do it by literally the end of June before they completely adjourn. So we're not going to really know on most of these issues until probably midway through uh, the spring. So a and administration will have already enacted its policies. And we're talking really about 22 and beyond. What's it mean 22 and beyond? Um, and, and secondly, the numbers of cases that are pending at the circuit court level will be really a bellwether as to how the court will move left, right, or more moderate. If the preponderance of issues working through the federal court system are pushing the healthcare system toward a much more um, federally controlled public enterprise versus a private sector driven industry, which is the big difference between a Trump view of healthcare. Trump says it's an industry, it's capital, it's a private decision. The Biden view is this is a universal right. Healthcare is a right, it's not a privilege. It's not a market. We have to regulate it. Watch the flow of uh, cases through the under 
courts to see where the challenges are. And if that challenge is pulling it more toward, we need the federal government to, to really do more, step up versus the private sector needs more latitude, that's where you'll see the bend of the court one way or the other. I don't believe in uh, this current court. It's as simple as we've got six conservative and we've got three liberal justices. I just don't think it'll be that way. Oh, that was a great answer. Um, obviously, we don't hear that type of granularity in the news media. So that was very, very helpful, I think, to all of our members. Um, I'll tell you something, my biggest frustration uh, out of all that we've talked about, I, I know a lot of the folks on this call, and uh, Kevin Churchwell has been an old friend, and I, I just, we don't do a very good job of educating our boards. And uh, community leaders about health care. Uh, we're so prone to sound bites and so prone to disinformation that we've got we've got to really step that up. And I hope everybody will do more than do an annual retreat. Um, I, I, I think it's about on a daily basis, we've got to inform ourselves and then through some mechanism, MHA, should think about how on a weekly basis can we recap everything our C-suites, our boards, uh, and our physicians need to know, because this thing's moving fast. It is. Everything seems to be speeded so up. You, you, <laughs> you can compare notes, with, compare notes with Steve about that, because it just really, it's getting out of hand. The disinformation and lack of information is, a, is, is huge. Yes. Well, again, thank you so much, Paul. You really are um, a great voice in the in the world of healthcare for our leaders. Uh, Matt, thank you from Lumeris for, for allowing Paul to come in this morning and help our leaders. Um, we will probably have a video of this tape that we send around to folks who attended. Um, and I hope everybody has a great day. Thank you so much. Thank you.